Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and the invitation to, to the Finnish Pension Center. I believe that the Finnish people are kind of uh, one of the headquarters of pension and retirement research in Europe, I would say, so I feel very honored. Um, the topic of my talk actually in some ways it kind of really overlaps with the talk before. So I'm really happy that I don't have to repeat everything you all already got introduced to the data source, for example. Um, my talk is about the role of life course and institutional characteristics for women's old age financial well-being in Europe and financial well-being. I will try to understand differences between the household um, dimension and the individual dimension. However, I will not focus on wealth. Yeah, so it's purely focusing on, on income. Um, but before we start with, with science, so to say, I have to greet my uh, grandmother who has her uh, 92 birthday today. So I have to say one sentence in German. Liebe Oma Helene, ich wünsche dir alles Gute zum Geburtstag und ich hoffe, du siehst das. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. This was just a, a personal thing, but I'm yeah, I, it would be nice that, or it would also be nice to be with her, of course. I'm also happy to be here. Okay, but to start with a, with a light introduction, um, and Francesca already talked about this. Actually, we have two developments uh, at the moment in, in European societies um, that are kind of the background for my research. So on the other, on the one hand, uh, when we look at the uh, at, at individuals' life courses, and that affects females' life, uh, women's life courses, as well as men's life courses. Um, we see two things happening. On the one hand, we are talking about a so-called feminization also of male careers, so everybody has more interruptions in their career. Everybody um, is also intent more, more, um, more affected by low-wage employment, for example. And everybody gets de-standardized career on the one hand. On the other hand, um, in, um, in women's careers, we see a development uh, towards higher rates of employment. And we have heard before, most of this uh, unfortunately takes place as part-time employment. So this is still a problem. Um, and we have, this was discussed before, increasing divorce rates and um, yeah, also instabilities in family histories. Uh, when we look at the social policies that are kind of the background for these developments, um, we, on the one hand, we have seen in many European countries so-called uh, flexibilization um, of flex security policies, meaning that kind of the traditional benefits that secure traditional male-like life courses, uh, the ones that are based on social security, um, they, are, they become lower. On the other hand, um, there is more money, or actually not more money, but, but there's more focus set on family policies that work in the, in the direction of reconciling work and, uh, work and family life. Uh, when we look at pensions, um, this is kind of the same. So here we also have different developments. On the one hand, um, the kind of classical pensions are reduced. We have higher, um, higher ages, uh, higher elig eligibility ages for, for, for going to retirement. But on the other hand, apart from this marketinization of pensions, we also see that this pension care entitlements, and Francesca talked about this shortly, so those entitlements who kind of compensate for care periods, they are, um, um, they are upgraded in many European countries. So there seems to be a kind of policy direction that is similar to, to this uh, kind of uh, direction of policies in, in labor market and, and family, family policy. Okay, um, so on, on this background, so to say, what are my research questions? So in the talk today, um, I will try to combine um, insights I have on the relationship of individual life courses and individuals' later life well-being. So the focus is here on trying to say what are kind of risks in individuals' lives, like unemployment, low-wage work or low occupational status work, for example. And of course, uh, for women, mostly uh, times when they are out of employment and care for children, um, how do these risks translate into risks in old age income and old age poverty. And then on the other hand, I'm trying to bring back in what, how can institutions, and here mostly those institutions that are related to the pension system, how can they compensate for these risks? Or do they maybe even intensify the risks that are in the life course when they translate them into a certain later life income? 
Um, so I will focus uh, with this on this individual perspective. I will focus on the effects of uh, motherhood and care and how they translate into um, income risks and old age. And for the pensions, I'm going to focus on this thing that's called pension care entitlements. Um, Yes, if this works, my talk uh, basically consists of, of three parts. First of all, I'm going to present an overall framework to understand um, the relationships of life course, later life, and institutions. And then I'm going to um, present results from two studies. First is rather general, so risks of uh, em employment life, how do they tr translate to later life well-being. And secondly, I'm going to focus on the motherhood penalty and pension income. And this also implies that actually my whole results and my whole presentation um, uh, with respect to the results is looking at women only. So when I'm talking about inequality, actually I'm not, not looking at gender inequality so much. I'm really looking at inequalities within the group of women, depending on whether they overtook care work, for example, or not. And um, I will skip some slides here in order not to, to overdo um, uh, the, the theory part. Um, this data set has been introduced before. I'm just um, saying some words on this. Um, all the results I'm presenting are based on the survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe. And as Francesca pointed out, at the moment, this share life study is the only one that we can use for looking at individuals' life courses in a lot of European countries because not every European country has so much nice administrative data like in Finland or in Germany, for example. Therefore, my sample for all the following on all the following slides will be quite reduced to these 13 countries and I'm very sorry but I do not have Finland in the data yeah so I'm happy that uh, happy to get more information on, on Finland maybe from you okay but before we start I said I'm focusing only on inequalities within the group of women so what I propose is in addition to looking at the gender gap in pension also paying to it paying attention to factors that kind of differentiate and um, create inequality in, uh, within the group of women. So basically pension systems, at least in all the countries I know, they do not discriminate against women per se, but they discriminate against certain types of life courses. And it's just a matter of fact that these life courses uh, that are discriminated against uh, are mostly yeah, female, uh, female life courses. So what do I show here? This is um, um, the motherhood gap in pension income. So how much does the pension income reduce per child a woman has? Um, you can see that uh, those those lines who cross the red red line at the middle, this means that the gap in this country is not significant. So for example, countries like Eastern Germany or Eastern Germany, the part of, of Germany, um, also Sweden, Denmark, like you would expect, those countries actually, they're the difference between women who have children and those without children in pension income is not really significant. On the other hand, you find a quite severe pension gap in Italy, for example, motherhood pension gap, um, and also in, in West Germany, France, and so on. So um, most of the, of, of, the, of the gender inequality in pensions actually is based on the fact that we are discriminating against mothers who have care leaves in their, in their life courses. Okay, but this is just, so to say, a, so, a short spoiler to give you an introduction on the results I'm going to show. Um, first, as I said, uh, I warned you there are some slides on a, on a kind of theoretical thinking, theoretical approach to this problem. So when we are thinking about well-being in old age, and how this could be influenced um, by policies. Yeah, of course, this is dependent on individual life course, but the question is here, what role do policies actually play? Then we always have to differentiate between those policies that influence individuals' decisions at the moment when they are happening. And here, for example, uh, one important um, life course relevant policy is, of course, family policies. So what decisions can women make during their life course? Do they have the possibility con to continue working when they have children? Um, the pension system, so to say, can only, as a life course sensitive institution, can only work ex post. So when, when we have a high inequality in life courses, then a pension system um, can only balance this to some degree, but it cannot change it anymore. So. Um, I'm focusing for, for the presentation here on the life course sensitive institutions, sensitive because they kind of evaluate 
live courses at a certain moment in time and based on this evaluation cal calculate, for example, a certain pension income. Um, so what we have to ask basically is not only how much inequality do we have in live courses, but we have to ask um, how what is, so to say, the normative pattern that is behind a national pension system. So how is this inequality in live courses actually taken into account by the national pension system? Um, at the moment, and, and there has been a um, lot of research in this, of course, in, in, wealth, in comparative welfare state, state research, um, at the moment we can say that most earnings-related pension system in Europe, and this is true for most of the countries and only countries like Denmark and the Netherlands, for example, deviate from this pattern. Most of these countries um, take the standard working career, which is um, the typical pattern of continuous full-time employment, as their normative assumption. So based on this assumption, they kind of evaluate individuals' life courses. Um, so now we have to ask when people... Uh, in, 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 what, what, uh, in what way can people deviate from this normative pattern? So what can be life cost risks that against this pattern actually could be a problem for later life income or later life or increased later life poverty risk? Um, so here we have to differentiate between two channels, so to say. Um, we could say that the first one is rather could be a problem for typical male biographies and the second one could be a problem for typical female biographies. However, as I said before, pension systems as such do not discriminate uh, based on gender. It's really the life course that matters. So um, looking, at, looking at employment histories, of course, um, spending time in atypical employment, and this might be part-time employment, of course, for women. Uh, for men, this might be employment in low-wage jobs or in jobs with a low occupational status. And this, uh, together with unemployment, um, this should be, from a theoretic, theoretical perspective, the greatest risks for later life income. Um, the second um, second possibility or the second life cause risk that has to be taken into account are basically care interruptions. Yeah, and this works in the same direction as unemployment. So um, when you work part-time or you do not work at all because you have small children at home or maybe also because you have to care for, for, uh, for elderly, frail persons, then this, of course, will be bad for your pension rights, for your pension entitlements. However, it's not really clear. Yeah, so here really the institutions come into place. So the question is in how far do national pension systems incorporate certain regulations that could compensate for care periods, for example. And as I said before, the policy direction in the moment really focuses on this and rather takes away pension rights, for example, due to unemployment. Yeah. So we should expect that maybe uh, care periods do not matter at the end because pension system balance for this in a good way. Okay, so when we put all this in kind of a theoretical framework, um, we have really, we, we can derive really kind of straightforward uh, ideas on what should happen in our data, what we should see. First of all, um, just to, to um, say again what I said at the beginning, um, I'm looking at the outcomes of old age income on the one hand and poverty risk on the other hand. And this also gives me an idea about the individual level and the household level because poverty risk is cal calculated based on the household income. So here partner's income is taken into account. Um, old age income, here I only look um, at those income uh, that individuals achieve when they are older. So I also exclude survivor's benefits, for example. So here we can assume that non-standard working career, of course, should lead to a lower old age income and to a higher poverty risk. Um, the same for the family biography. And I'm going to give more details on this later, but we can expect that due to divorce, for example, um, due to uh, the problem that um, you could become a single parent after divorce and so on, uh, you could expect that you should have a lower old age income and a higher poverty risk. However, actually, this is not that clear. We will see it when I show you the results, because um, being single might also provide an incentive to be active on the labor market for women, but we will see this later. 
Um, let's take a closer look on this relationship of number of children and old age income. And this, ha this has been discussed before, so I just would like to, to kind of um, explain to you what different channels we can expect. So why, why do we see in our empirical data and why could we assume that the more children a woman has, the lower will be her pension income. And here I'm talking about the individual, the personal income. So first of all, this might be just be due to the fact that uh, this woman has lower years in employment. Yeah, and we have seen before this is the main factor that is important for later life income. Um, and here, as I said before, the question is if, um, if pension systems should, should be earnings related, then this, this should not be a problem of pension systems to compensate for this. Yeah. Because if the normative assumption is that, uh, that pension systems are kind of relative or pension is relative to, to, to wages in your life before, then this is not a problem that can be cared for. The second thing is um, the second possibilities why mothers could have a lower income is uh, due to the fact that there could really be wage discrimination. So employers basically could pay lower wages to mothers. And we see this in research for the U.S., for example, that shows that married men with children actually get a premium on their wages and a married, married woman with children actually get a penalty. So the, the fact or this sign here could be due to real discrimination. And also due to the fact that we have labor market segregation. This was addressed in the, in the introductory note. So what can we expect? First of all, as soon as we kind of incorporate the idea that there might be different years in employment, we should not see any effect of number of children. Yeah, the, the effect should just vanish because this is only due to the fact that care episodes appear in, in the life course. The second thing is when we are talking about discrimination as such and working in lower occupation, uh, occup lower status occupation jobs, um, then we should also see that mothers actually get a lower return from being employed. Yeah, so the years they spend in employment should count less for their pension income due to the fact that they are discriminated against and achieve lower wages. And this, this is then really a problem that needs to be addressed in labor market policy and in, in family policy, for example. Okay, now the question is after remaining first of all on this on this individual level uh, relationship the question now is when we look at pension systems what role can they actually play before i said a lot um, okay for this and that reason pension systems are maybe not should not be taken into account for this but the question is what what can they actually do so we again have to think of pension systems and regulation as life cost sensitive institutions so they evaluate what happened already um, so they are basically based on, pre on, on previous research and literature. Um, there are two factors that should be really important for compensating for this um, um, lower, lower pension income of mothers or women in general. Uh, first of all, and this has been discussed a, lo discussed a lot, the so-called pension care entitlements. And there are really different versions of these pension care entitlements in, in, in European countries. Um, I will talk about this later. But Apart from two countries in my sample, at least every country has this. So we almost find no pension system where you at least do not have a little benefit for, for, for care leaves, for example. Um, the second thing that should be important is, so to say, the degree of redistribution in the pension system. And this basically um, goes into the direction in thinking about whether a pension system is strongly earnings related or maybe incorporates some elements that are, for example, a basic pension, but they are at least unconditional of anything that happened before. Yeah. And as, as, as more of these elements are included in national pension system, the less should be or the more should be uh, compensated for, for, for um, changes in individuals' life courses. So um, to just talk about this a little bit more with some with some indicators. So when when we think of uh, of possible indicators that could be important when evalu evaluating uh, pension systems, first of all we would need to think about how strong is the is, is the earnings relation in a pension system. So how much 
redistributive elements are included. Um, secondly, um, we could think of um, some pension systems, for example, have a rule that uh, certain years of minimum contribution years is necessary to achieve, achieve a pension at all. And of course, this should discriminate against women. Uh, we have heard about pension privatization before. So we could also say that um, um, those pension systems that rely on private and occupational pensions to a high degree, they should also discriminate against um, kind of in uh, interruptions in life courses and what I'm going to focus on are pension care entitlements and the question is always um, how do these factors kind of interact with individuals life courses okay I'm just going to give an overview of this quickly so for pension system redistribution the assumption would be that it compensate, compensates for non-standard life courses Contribution years, um, this is quite obvious, that should intensify the link between life courses and pension system. And for privatization, it's not that clear, but I'm going to, to skip this point. Um, for pension care entitlements, a first guess would be that they should help mothers, that they should kind of compensate for, for, uh, for care episodes. However, you could also argue that the higher pension care entitlements are, the higher is the incentive to stay away from the labor market. Therefore, this, this indicator is actually very ambiguous. Yeah, you might also argue that high pension care entitlements work in the direction of not being employed as a mother. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say much on this because this has been has been uh, talked about already before. So I'm also using the life course data that is provided by the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe. Um, I'm going to focus on women only and therefore inequalities as far as I will show them, they are not uh, with respect to inequalities between men and women, but really inequalities within the group of women. I, this is kind of an important point. I'm um, using information on life course data starting uh, from early age until basically retirement age. And this has been cut at the age of 60 because we have some countries still in the sample that, uh, where women are allowed to retire earlier. Um, I'm going to look at two income um, yeah, two income measures. The first of all, the individual income. Um, this is really looking at how much pension entitlements basically has a woman on her own. Yeah, this is excluding survivor's benefits and this is also excluding any, uh, any partner incomes. However, um, the poverty risk, this is calculated based on household income. So here the partner's income and all the other income sources come into play. Um, Yes, uh, the measures, measures, I will explain them to you uh, when I show the results slides. Um, for, the, for the country level, um, here actually we have a problem that we do not have measures for everything. So first of all, uh, for the redistribution in the pension system, um, I, I created an indicator that actually looks whether a pension system has some elements that are unconditional. So does a pension system have a basic pension, for example? Um, I'm going to skip this for the pension care entitlements. Uh, here I created an own indicator that gives us an impression of how generous are those pension care entitlements. Yeah, so um, the OECD up to now doesn't include an indicator on this. Um, therefore, it was necessary to create an own indicator. Um, maybe to, to give you some impression of how this relates to actual employment level of women. So we could argue that those countries who have high employment levels of women, they don't need something like a pension care entitlement. Actually, we find a large variation within Europe. You find countries here in dark blue, for example, like Sweden and, and, and France, they have really generous pension care entitlements, so they give a lot to women uh, as add-on on their pension for each child. And we have countries like the Netherlands and Denmark in light white color here that do not have anything like pension care entitlements. It's just not there. They have no regulation for this in their pension systems. However, we see that this is not uh, in accordance with the employment rates. For example, Dutch women have um, 
a low share of full-time employment, but at the same time, the pension system doesn't compensate for this so much by means of pension care entitlements. On the other hand, people in Sweden, they have very generous benefits and a high female employment rate. So there's no clear relationship between those both. Okay, um, good. I'm going to skip this and just going directly to the results. So first of all, um, I'm going to present the results on uh, employment history and, and uh, later life income. Um, yeah, just to point out a few things. A few things are really in, in, uh, in the same like has been uh, announced before by Francesca. First of all, what is really important is the years in employment. Yeah, so here you always have the blue bar that indicates the overall effect and the red bar then in addition controls for country differences yeah because we have different income levels in countries different employment behavior of women and so on so what we can see the more years a woman has worked in her life the higher is her personal income later on and the lower is the poverty risk um, when we look at occupational status here we find, a, we find a similar pattern. So the more a woman has worked in low-status jobs, obviously uh, the lower will be her pension income and the higher will be the poverty risk at the end. What we also see for non-standard employment, and this is mainly consisting of part-time employment, here we find the effect to become insignificant after controlling for country differences. This means here the pension system really plays a role. So part-time work per se is not a problem in all European countries. It just becomes a problem depending on um, how the regulations in your national system are actually like. Uh, we have, for example, the Netherlands that contribute very much to this, where a lot of women work part-time, but they have a basic pension at the same time. Yeah, so here the effect kind of becomes balanced. Um, years married, years, uh, years um, being divorced, um, this goes into the same direction like it was explained before. We have maybe to see that for divorce we get a very interesting pattern because of course divorced women face a higher poverty risk but they also have a higher individual income than those women who have not been divorced or who remarried after a short time. So here um, the fact really is that women who are single actually have a higher tendency to participate in labor market, but they do not achieve as high wages as men, for example. Um, the same for being single mother, so this is really a poverty risk for old age. Um, I'm going to, to skip this and talking directly now about the results for what is kind of balancing um, um, care episodes in, in individuals in, in women's life. And here you have the same style of tables. I'm just going to walk you shortly through the, through the results. So first of all, what we can see is that for each child, women get, so to say, a significant decrease in their pension income. Yeah, and this is controlled for all country differences. Um, but what we see in addition, as soon as we introduce controls for employment history, so as soon as we take into account in our estimations that mothers work lower number of years and they have a higher number of years in part-time employment, for example, as soon as we take this into account, we do not have any significant effect of number of children. So discrimination of mothers is not really discrimination of mothers or women, but it really depends on the fact that most of our European pension systems are designed as earning re earnings related pension systems. Okay, what we also see, but this is just a side note, um, the effects of educational level become insignificant after controlling for employment history. So for women, it really counts how much they worked, and this even counts more than their in initial educational degree they got at the beginning of their life. Okay, but the question now is when we see this here, that um, this motherhood penalty and pension income is really dependent on the fact that mothers work less and work more in low-paid jobs and work more in, in part-time. The question now is what in pension systems can actually compensate for this we, we observe, yeah, for the fact that there are women working less, working more in unpaid care work actually, how can this be balanced by national pension system? 
And here I would like to focus on, on two factors that in each of my studies emerged as the main important factors when we try to look at the importance or at the um, significance of pension systems for women's later life income. First of all, redistribution in pension systems. And this is really um, relating to the fact that some pension systems in, in Europe put less weight on the earnings-related uh, pillar of pensions, on the earnings-related tire. Here we can see that um, for those systems that incorporate um, a high redistribution in their pension systems, meaning that they have basic pensions, for example, that are unconditional of everything that happened before, um, those elements actually balance for care interruptions in, um, in life courses quite successfully. Um, on the other hand, those systems that are strongly earnings related, they are really the ones that go along with the high penalty for motherhood in old age income. Um, the second thing that I would like to highlight is the importance or maybe not importance of these so-called pension care entitlements. So they are intended to balance care episodes and to balance the motherhood penalty and pension income. What we can see in the data is actually a reverse picture. So um, the more generous those pension care entitlements are, the higher is actually um, the motherhood penalty and pension income. And um, this is due to the fact that those countries who have either very low pension care entitlements, so very, not very generous, or they do not have them at all, they balance for, for inequalities in life courses in other ways, and they are more successful with this instead of um, relying on pension care entitlements. So, um, just to give, give a short summary, first of all, what we have seen, of course, the typical um, life course risks like they have been um, explained before, low-wage jobs and um, non-employment, part-time employment, they contribute to the motherhood penalty in, in pensions and then in a second step also to the gender inequality in pensions. Um, for divorce, for example, I would be more cautious because we can see that divorced women face a higher poverty risk in old age. But as we have seen before, they also to achieve to have higher personal incomes than those women who have been continuously married. Yeah, so this is really an, an, a puzzle that's not really clear whether divorce per se is actually bad for, for pension income. In Germany, for example, just to, to explain a, a nice regulation, after divorce, all the pension points of the couple are split up into two parts and each partner gets 50%. Yeah, so the pension system in this case, in my country, uh, compensates, compensates for divorce quite, quite good. Um, Looking um, on, on these institutional effects, first what, what we have seen with respect to mothers, um, discrimination or their lower pensions are not only due to care episodes, they are really also due to wage discrimination and working in lower status jobs. Yeah. So if we would like to adjust for this by pension systems, I would say this is not really possible. Yeah, here really family policy, as we will see in the next presentation, and labor market policy has to, um, yeah, has to be reformed or has to be improved to tackle this problem. Um, secondly, um, I would like to highlight that it's really, if, if the intention of the pension system is that it should be earnings related, then it's just a matter of fact that it reproduces inequalities uh, from working life and translates them into later life. Yeah. So if this should not be um, should not be like this, then there just has to be more redistribution and more unconditional benefits in in pension system. Secondly, uh, pension care entitlements, of course, they give a plus in income for a specific woman that had a lot of children, for example, but the overall picture shows that in those countries with very generous pension care entitlements, we do not see that the gap in pension income between mothers and childless women is very small. The opposite is the case. It's, it's, it is actually larger. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to, to skip the, the country examples. I just want to repeat that really the overall design of the pension system is crucial and not really the small um, um, kind of um, 
uh, the, the benefits that are related, for example, to pension care entitlements. Okay, um, comments and questions are very welcome. Uh, if you would like to read on the motherhood penalty and pension income further, uh, I would like to um, highlight, highlight the paper that has been published last year. And first of all, thank you for your attention. Feels nice, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody's standing up. <laughs> Thank you, Katya, for an excellent presentation and the important reminder that it's not only differences between men and women, it's also inequalities within a gender. We are going to steal a few minutes from our coffee break so we can have a few questions. So, questions and comments. Uh, thank you. Josef Braunberger, Federal Ministry of Social Affairs, Austria. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that uh, the earnings-related pension systems penalize motherhood and increase uh, the risk of poverty for in old age for women. On the other hand, redistributive system and minimum pension systems uh, are better in this uh, in this sense, but. Do you think that such systems um, have a negative impact of the employment uh, rate for women? Um, no, I see here one. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Anna Dadir on mm -hmm. care entitlement. Mm -hmm. And she had some nice um, resuming figures on uh, the effect of the care entitlements for mm -hmm. children. And uh, her conclusion was basically depending, I mean, uh, they um, reduced the gender gap by mm -hmm. something I go by memory. Uh, by like uh, three to seven percent, mm -hmm. depending on an interval yeah. that could go from one year to 15 years, and depending on the country. This happened in the OECD. Mm -hmm. So obviously the result was very different across countries. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. um, in some countries they do seem to make a difference, however. And uh, it depends on how they are formulated. I uh, gave the example of Spain, where they're very simple and they seem to be effective. Now, my question is very simple. Do you think that a European directive on care entitlement, setting sort of, you know, uniform mm -hmm. basis, but roughly effective in all countries, could be useful? And I'm asking that also because we, we always talk about care entitlement for children. What about those for leave of care for the elderly, which is becoming more and more common, and with which we'll have to struggle in the future. Why don't we extend the concept and maybe ask EU to sort of, you know, have a sort of minimum or more than a minimum basis with the European directive? That's a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for the very, very interesting questions. Um, the first one, uh, maybe I didn't understand this completely, um, why this unconditional benefit should have a negative effect on women's employment rate. Um, I, I can say some words about, about the unconditional benefits. Um, first of all, what, what, what is in the Austrian system, what, what is similar to what, what we uh, we're thinking about in Germany, um, you have to differentiate between different types of basic pensions, though there are some minimum pensions around, um, I believe in Austria it might be the same like, like in my country, um, that are actually not unconditional. So they are called minimum pensions, but they put a lot of uh, conditions um, related to individual's life courses so that, that you can actually be eligible for those pensions. Um, and I didn't say so much about the indicator of, of, of basic pensions and redistribution, but those minimum pensions that are actually have the name of, 
or that sound as being basic but are very conditional, they do not have a positive uh, positive effect for, for, for women. Yeah, so it needs to be really basic, unconditional pensions. And maybe in this case, politicians need to stop to think that they need to put conditions on uh, on people to force them to a certain behavior. This doesn't work at all. Yeah, so there is re research showing that um, if you change a pension into a pension care entitlements, for example, this has been done in in the 90s in Germany. Women's employment behavior doesn't change. People don't think about their 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 70s when they're when they're 30, for example. So all these conditions that are usually put into minimum <laughs> pensions, this doesn't work out. And it, in 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 this case, this, the motherhood penalty, where I looked at, uh, it doesn't play out to compensate anything. These kind of minimum pensions. Um, Okay, this pension care entitlements, first of all, um, I, I, I would again like to highlight that I'm always looking at inequality within the group of women. So pension care entitlements, um, of course, if they are directed to compensating the gender pension gaps, the inequality between men and women, um, then this might contribute to a certain, some, some percentage points in, in the country, depending on what country you're actually looking at. Um, what, what I just see is that the overall picture um, doesn't change much because pension care entitlements, even if they are generous on my indicator, they are not generous compared to all the other regulations in the pension system. So earnings-related pensions, they are just always the amount of money is much larger. So um, it, it appears to me that in some countries they are trying to to force this discussion about pension care entitlements uh, to kind of make people not look at the inequality they have in their earnings-related pensions. Yeah, And therefore it might be that countries where this earnings relation link is very strong, they at the same time have high, have very generous pension care entitlements, but this doesn't change the inequality. Yeah, so would, I would, I would uh, totally agree that this, this, this remains to be a problem. And uh, for European Union, um, if, if they, if they are thinking about um, 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 having a common idea of the, what these pension care entitlements should look like. Um, then they really should also be in a in a in, in a way like um, unconditional benefits. We have some countries still in Europe that uh, give pension care entitlements only if there is a care interruption, for example. Yeah, and this gives, of course, a, dis a disincentive to working. So uh, I think the Spanish example you mentioned was quite good for those uh, newer cohorts. And also, I would. Uh, yeah, I, I have to. I have to say also, I don't like the, the German pension care entitlements, but they are also the design is quite good. They are unconditional, unconditional. They do not depend on care interruptions, for example. So this this would be a, a nice regulation then. Yeah.